this is our biannual Women, Gender, Sexuality Studies program um, feminist lecture series. It's uh, made possible by a gift from Carol McCobadai, who's a emeritus um, faculty in anthropology, which is um, the department actually that, um, that Maribel sounds like sometimes teaches in and also graduated out of. So that's really um, special. And today is also um, International Women's Day, which is um, a, a day to kind of commemorate um, the contributions of women around the world, but actually started as a um, kind of economic, uh, women's economic empowerment uh, day to really um, fight for equity, in economic equity. Um, so every March 8th, we commemorate um, women's history, or sorry, International Women's Day. And um, so it's, it's just great to kind of be able to commemorate um, that day with this event. And I want to introduce our speaker for today, um, Maribel Martinez, who has so many, uh, you know, qualifications and credentials. I won't go on and on to say them all, but um, most notably, um, she was the founding director of the um, Cesar Chavez Community Action Center here at San Jose State, and then um, more recently has gone on to be the founding director of the Office of LGBTQ Affairs, um, which is the first office of its kind in the United States, and really incredible that it's um, not only here in Santa Clara County, but also that one of our own SJSU alum and um, affiliates is, is really spearheading that. So we invited her to share with us about her work and, um, and what the office is doing and also um, the impacts of COVID-19 on, um, on the LGBTQ community and communities of color. So Maribel, I'll just turn it over to you and thank you so much. We'll, um, we'll do like 30 minutes of her sharing and then have like 20 or 30 minutes for um, Q&A, and I'm going to spotlight you. Great. Hi, okay. everyone. Buenas tardes, Maribel Martinez. And, um, you know, I think sometimes when we do, prior to COVID, if I were to do a lecture, you know, I'd want it to be like we're having a conversation in my living room. And now in COVID, we actually get to have this conversation in my living room. Um, because I'm working remote uh, uh, for some days, but some days I still go into the office, um, you know, and I would have my, I have my candle lit and I have, you know, a comfy couch. And so what I wanna do is just have, have a platica, have a conversation, share a little bit about myself and the work. And why, what I enjoy most when I'm meeting, um, you know, people whose work that I admire, um, I really want to get to know them as a person, want to know their journey, Um, want to really know their journey, want to really know how they got to a particular pl place and, and see how that was a progression to their work. Um, so, you know, I'll start, um, I have, in, and then for me, I'm also like totally into um, the data. And so I, I'll share some slides that have data pieces to them um, and so for me, it's really important for folks to know that I was born and raised here in San Jose, in East San Jose. Um, for the most part of my, my childhood, uh, my parents were undocumented. Um, uh, they, they were born in Mexico. And so that really has shaped, you know, how I see the world. Um, I attended public schools um, and really a lot. Um, that I was um, able to receive from, you know, aspirational wealth, navigational wealth, and, and really looking at um, the networks that I was connected to. You know, my parents worked really hard. They um, looked for resources. Um, the areas that we didn't have, you know, we found somehow, right? So I grew up at the, um, at the library and had lots of books and thought like that was the most amazing thing was that I could take 10 books every week home. Um, and so 
in East San Jose in the 80s um, was, you know, kind of a really um, uh, lots of activity happening, lots of gang um, violence happening. Um, and I was able to navigate some of that. My parents were able to navigate that um, with lots of community support and, and attention. So I, so I, so I share that. Um, and I think, again, asserting positionality and, and describing that super important to understanding different pathways. I identify as a queer Chicana, Chicanex, um, uh, of indigenous background. Uh, my family is from Mexico, from Guanajuato. So we identify as Purepecha, uh, Toltec, Mexica, uh, combination of that. And I really look at traditional teachings um, as a grounding framework. Um, identify as a woman, but in a very expansive way. Um, I kind of reject the notions of, of uh, fragility and some of these kind of um, notions that are very Western um, thoughts on, on womanhood. Um, you know, in, in my family, the women are the ones that were running everything. And um, it wasn't, you know, be afraid of your dad, but be afraid of what your mom's going to tell you. Um, and my grandma, my maternal grandmother was like the, the rancho's um, like main leader. She was um, of her of her generation was the only literate woman um, was the one that you would go to advice and counsel. And she was also very skilled in um, in using um, yerbas and plantas to to treat folks. Um, my maternal grandmother um, was a very devout. Um, Catholic woman, um, very loving, um, endured a lot of suffering, but also show, showed it a, an amazing strength um, and the amazing capacity to love and forgive um, and, and grow in a family in that way. And so, so I, I really look at womanhood from, from that lens and from that expansive lens um, and look at, you know, different um, the, the pantheon of, of Mesoamerican, you know, deities that are like just strong and sometimes violent and sometimes transformative. Um, and so that broad, that broad range identifies queer and two spirit um, and really kind of bring into the work that full authentic self um, that sometimes is able to create bridges and sometimes I feel recipient of some of the inequities and the biases that are that are in, that are kind of baked into our systems. Um, I am a in applied anthropology from San Jose State. I have a BA in political science with a minor in sociology, um, and then I've gone on to get different certificates in public policy and fellowships um, across the nation, uh, really looking at ways that our systems, um, our government systems play a role in how um, resources are distributed, particularly to the most vulnerable. What I think is really fascinating, and this is, I think, um, hope students who watch this hear this, um, for the last 14 years, I've done a job that didn't exist before me. So I never, you know, when people were asking me as I was graduating from undergrad or even graduate, like what I would be doing, I never imagined I'd be doing this work. And actually this work didn't exist then. So if you're, if you're, if you're at San Jose State and you're not quite sure what you will do with that degree, um, have comfort in the fact that perhaps what you're gonna be doing doesn't quite exist yet or it's waiting for you to start it. Uh, because that's exactly what I've done for the last 14 years. Um, I have a foundation in community organizing. I was a national community organizer uh, through the PICO network. And I think now it's called Faith in Action. Um, and then went on to uh, work at the Cesar Chavez Community Action Center and, and really build that from scratch, um, working with students there on campus. Uh, and it's been really gratifying to have been a student there, you know, have had those classes in those exact same buildings. And then to be back as a staff member and now as a faculty member um, to, to be in that role and, and provide the spaces that I wish I would have had back then or had the opportunities to unpack 
what was happening in my life um, and to be able to infuse it. And that's exactly what I wanted to do um, with the Sisa Chavez Center is to create a space that really prepared students to engage in community in a thoughtful and meaningful way. Um, you know, my background uh, then led to me uh, joining and starting the Office of LGBTQ Affairs, which was the first of its kind in the US, a, a county really wanting to look at ways in which they could improve their system from a policy, from a systems, from um, a practice and program aspect to really focus on how to support LGBTQ community. And again, what was different was that in the years prior, a lot of the LGBTQ work had been focused on supports for the individual. But what we know about communities, particular communities of color, is that to provide support for the individual, you really have to provide support for the entire family, you have to provide support for the entire community. And so I'm able to step into this work with that particular framework and really build uh, policy and systems uh, toward that end. Um, in the last year, we've created a division of equity and social justice at the county government level. And we've begun the work of um, affiliated with GARE, which is the Government Alliance on Race and Equity, um, which is a national uh, effort through Race Forward, where other local government jurisdictions are also looking to address racial inequity and um, how to institutionalize racial equity frameworks of last year, so it's almost going to be a year, um, I've been reassigned and deployed as a disaster, uh, disaster service worker responding to the COVID-19 pandemic here locally. And so I've been working out of the Emergency Operations Center, um, again, leading a team that did not exist before. So I'm focusing on language access, making sure that all of the information that the county puts forward is translated in our five threshold languages. Um, as a community as large and as diverse as Santa Clara County, we can't make an assumption that everybody is online, everybody gets their information um, through um, email or text. Uh, we can't rely that everyone understands or has English as, their, as a fluency. Um, and so we're looking at ways that we send out messages. And so I'm overseeing the language access team and the Latinx messaging and we decided to have this messaging be so um, specialized because we were looking at the fact that across the state as well, um, more than half of the COVID cases were um, from the Latinx community. And the messages just weren't reaching the population they were intended to. And even now with vaccination, uh, earlier on, there were some barriers for folks to learn about if they were eligible for vaccination or showing documentation. And of course, when you have a community that has experience in their, um, in their history, um, violence and abuse from government, um, then it's really hard to have that trust. And, re and, and that's exactly what we're doing is rebuilding that trust, rebuilding that communication, uh, ensuring that there, are, that there are safe and effective pathways to share information for folks who need it the most. Um, and then I'm also leading the recovery effort. So right now we're in the response, uh, but pretty soon once there's more vaccines, once more people um, have gotten vaccinated, we'll start to move into the recovery effort and think about you know, what ways could we reinforce our current system so that if something were to happen again, we'd be better equipped to respond. How can we um, make whole some of the folks who have endured the most during this time. And so I'll be leading the efforts um, for a group called the AFN MAC, which is um, Access and Functional Needs um, and Multi-Agency Coordination. Um, and this is a, a code in the California um, law that places a lot of focus on folks who are most vulnerable, communities most vulnerable, and that includes um, women, children, seniors, um, people who don't have a fluency in English, um, un, uh, immigrants, um, and you know, folks who um, aren't always the first to get information. So, that, so that's a, a role there uh, that I'll be playing once we are further into that process.
And for me, you know, really it's, it's a combination of all of the things that I've learned, all the things that I've experienced. And, um, you know, Cornell West has this line um, that he says that um, justice is what love looks like in public. And if I was so bold and so audacious, I took it one step further and I, and I say that equity is what healing looks like in public. Um, and, when we, and when we do um, this kind of healing work, this equity work, uh, it's really about transforming these public spaces, these public systems, and acknowledge the racial trauma, the historical racial trauma, and open up access to opportunities that were otherwise not available uh, to certain populations. And we have to do both an acknowledgement of the past and a creation of a new future for us to do this work really well. And so for the County of Santa Clara, um, we're using data, uh, and again, this is qualitative and quantitative data um, to really understand the local and national landscape of LGBTQ experiences and what are the resources. We wanna understand how people enter public systems and then we want to address the bias and the gaps in these systems. And most importantly, we want to give visibility and amplify voices. We understand that historically policies have been made um, without those who are most impacted by them, without those voices, and we want to change that. Um, and some of that has to do with some of the visibility and making spaces safe. And some of that needs to do, has to do with transforming systems themselves to be able to be responsive and to be able to um, create a safe way for folks to give input um, in, a, as a means of um, exerting their own agency and will and self-determination. And so I often start with this slide that something that as social scientists, we've kind of have learned and have gotten ingrained um, that first we meet these uh, physiological needs. And, and that's where the, a lot of the work of the county has been, right, in creating um, these uh, public safety nets and um, social services of shelters and um, food uh, distribution. And that that's the kind of the, you have, you have to meet those basic needs before you could meet any of the needs and eventually get to self-actualization. And, um, you know, new research is actually saying that that's actually inaccurate. In his, in his framework, um, and that really that kind of first basic um, level is love and belonging. Um, this is, and this is work from um, cognitive social sciences, primarily the work of um, Dr. Lieberman at UCLA, that really talks about the way that people really want to be connected, and that when you're not connected, it creates the social pain. Um, and we see that, right, if, at the most vulnerable when we're infants, if we don't belong to a community, if we don't belong to a family, if there isn't a system that's willing to take care of us, then, we, then none of these other needs can be fulfilled. Um, and likewise, we begin to see some of that work in, in public policy and in local governments as we look at uh, sanctuary cities or jurisdictions, as we look at age-friendly counties that we're really having to put a vulnerable population at the center if we're really trying to make their, their wellness be central to the work that we do. And so applying this to the LGBTQ community is that we have to look at ways in which um, messages of love and belonging are shared with this community, knowing that not only does it need to raise a certain level, but it actually has to overcome the historical uh, presence of negative and othering that has happened. And we see this in permanency disruptions. And by permanency, I mean people staying in their homes, people staying in their it's, um, and, and we see that, um, that there is a huge permanency disruption for the LGBTQ community. Um, overall, you know, um, this, and this is, this is data particularly for youth, uh, experience homelessness at higher rates at 40%. This is a national statistic. Um, in juvenile justice, uh, they're overrepresented at 20% of youth in juvenile justice identifies LGBTQ. Um, 
and uh, in, our, in our child welfare system, uh, they represented about 19%. This is a study that happened at uh, uh, LA County. Um, and within the school system, right, which is supposed to be one of those first safety nets for youth, um, about 85% of youth in public schools across the nation um, have experienced bullying and harassment. Um, and it's not just this identity, it's not their LGBTQ identity. Um, it's also looking at, you know, looking at them as whole and looking at, you know, intersectional um, points of identity. Um, because when we look at Those are the kids that we see entering child welfare system. Um, when we look at the kids who are attending public school in California, overwhelmingly, they're Latinx, they're kids of color. Um, and so those numbers need to have also not just what we call SOGI, sexual orientation, gender identity and expression. They need to have a SOGI lens, but they also need to have a race and ethnicity lens on that um, because that also determines uh, what, are, what folks have accessible to them, and what are some of the pathways and barriers that they, that they face? Um, one of the, the most compelling data pieces that I've seen is the work coming out of serious policy research, the work of Dr. Angela Irvine. Um, and she um, made this, one, this analysis, right? This is stark analysis for youth um, and girls in particular in the California justice system. So in the earlier slide, you saw that about 20% of all kids in uh, juvenile justice identifies LGBTQ. When you disaggregate that and look at kids in boys' detention centers, it's about um, uh, nine to 12%. And when you look at youth in girls' detention centers, it's about 50%, 50, 51%. So that's a huge um, data point, right? And so we look at ways in which women and girls are criminalized or um, are othered, are seen as deviant, and then you add this SOGI lens to it, and then you add a racial lens to it, and her data findings here is that compared to one white straight girl in the general population that ends up in the justice system, mm -hmm. uh, a white LGBTQ girl is eight times more likely to enter the juvenile justice system. Um, a Latina, a lesbian, bisexual, queer girl is 15 times more likely. A black, lesbian, bisexual, queer girl is 71 times more likely. And a girl who is a lesbian, bisexual, queer with more than one um, racial or ethnic identity is 265 times more likely to enter the justice system. So when we look at data that's compelling like this, we know that it's not an individual we know that it's not a population. We know that there is bias in our system. We know that there, are, that there have been clear um, pipelines in terms of our policy gaps that have uh, you know, ushered kids in this way and have often pushed them out of school systems or community support systems and into um, these you know, um, either child welfare or justice involved pathways. So in Santa Clara County, um, again, we often think of ourselves as super progressive and you know, that's maybe those numbers are, are something that exist maybe in other pockets of California, um, if at all, right? And so in Santa Clara County, we also have um, some of those challenges. Um, and so through the California Healthy Kids Survey that happens, again, these are kids in middle and high school public schools here locally, about 30 to, um, 30.9% of lesbian, gay, bisexual kids in high schools um, seriously considered attempting suicide in the last year compared to counterparts. There's huge kind of data gaps there, right? In terms of the points difference. And so that is a very telling, um, telling narrative. Um, in public schools, those who have been bullied or harassed, around 68% of LGB um, youth have been harassed compared to only 27% of straight kids. 
And here in Santa Clara County, about 30% um, of youth experiencing homelessness identifies LGBTQ. Um, and this data comes from the um, developmental assets um, and really looking at middle and high school students and that only 31% uh, of LGBTQ students felt safe. Um, only 19% um, showed high self-esteem. 2% um, reported positive family communication. And I focus on youth because that's where we have the most data. Um, I do recognize that we have huge data gaps because SOGI data, and again, SOGI stands for sexual orientation, gender identity, and expression, isn't something that we routinely um, collect uh, across our systems. And that's something that we're really pushing because if we don't have the data, we can't compare, we can't look at uh, health disparities. And so that data piece is really missing. And it's also something that is um, counter to the narratives that we've had in our systems and in our society about, you don't talk about your sexual orientation, you don't talk about your gender identity if it falls outside of the binary. Um, and so that's a lot of kind of cultural uh, shift, organizational culture um, of asking this and having that be an insight into services and supports, have that be a value added on how we um, further support individuals in our, in our system. And of course, this data comes from test, uh, testimonials, um, lived experience that 100% of LGBTQ individuals are beautiful, um, that um, they 100% are talented, skilled, and a value to our community, um, and they're resilient. And they share this counterpoint because oftentimes in public policy, we look at the disparities, we look at these negative viewpoints, and we fail to bring up all the assets and all the wonderful ways in which community does rally around each other, does support each other, and is often there um, for this particular you know, subpopulation, is often there um, with folks that are start off as, as, as friends and, and could quickly become a chosen family or a chosen support network. And so in our office, we really looked at what are the, what could we do that could be different? How could we strategically implement this? It's really about collaboration because our office can't, you know, do everything for the entire system. So we rely on our department uh, and different agency um, collaborators. We really are looking at data and in, in areas where data doesn't exist then we need to find ways to collect data. And that data can't just sit on a, in, in a report or sit in a, you know, in a brief somewhere, it needs to be actionable. And so we've actually taken a lot of action, even in five years, which Center, um, which is a public This is a clinic in our um, public health system that takes uh, Medicare, Medi-Cal, um, low-income folks who are uninsured, underinsured, they can find um, access there um, for their medical needs. We've also opened the New Haven Inn, which is an LGBTQ-focused transitional housing facility that supports folks who are 18 and over. Um, and these folks, cannot enter back into homelessness. So there's a pathway for permanent housing. Um, we've also secured um, a training module um, that's called Step In, Speak Up. Um, it's, we, we purchased it and are um, able to then um, distribute it back to all middle and high schools um, for, them to for them to have staff, volunteers, faculty have a baseline understanding on how to support LGBTQ youth. Um, we are launching um, uh, LGBTQ, or we have launched LGBTQ workplace training. So this is the first government workplace conversation simulator for all public employees um, through our, our agency for them to understand the importance of LGBTQ cultural competency. Um, we have invested over half a million dollars in training dollars around LGBTQ related uh, training and capacity building for those serving all ages in our mental health services department. And we're really looking to build 
um, a physical location and tons of virtual and support um, pathways for wellness and wellness in the broadest sense. Um, really looking at it from a preventative early intervention um, upstream model. Um, we're also launching a transgender economic empowerment project, um, really looking at ways to strengthen um, economic stability for transgender individuals. We're looking inward uh, of county systems and what are the major gaps uh, and, um, and what are the supports that are needed for folks who are transgender, non-binary, gender diverse to see the county um, as a future employer. The county is one of the main public sector employers in this area. Um, and so we wanna make sure that we are attracting amazing talent and that um, folks um, have the fewest barriers to um, being able to um, join our, our, our teams. And then again, as I mentioned, finding data, um, we are launching an LGBTQ senior survey um, that will help us get a better understanding of the local lived experience of LGBTQ seniors here. And then one of our biggest initiatives is support out. Um, this is a, a, an effort that's really looking to transform the experiences of LGBTQ youth of color. And starting off with the question of what would it look like to have a community that really supports every youth especially LGBTQ youth of color um, and provides pathways for their self-determination uh, in the most expansive and supportive ways. And the first phase for SMAPing, um, not just what's here locally, but what have other jurisdictions done across the nation um, and then the phase two, which we're joining now is collecting SOGI data um, within child welfare, probation, behavioral health and public health. And then once we have all of those uh, data and robust systems, we'll be engaging with community and youth centered leadership. You know, in this way, we're supporting out, supporting being out, but also supporting youth out of our public systems and finding pathways for them to thrive. Um, lastly, just really briefly, I'll share about the work that I've been doing around COVID-19 response and structural racism and all the other pandemics and um, uh, crises that have happened, right? We've seen uh, an election take place. We've seen uh, insurgency. We mobilized this team to do language access. And because we're a large county that has this um, this resource, it's actually our communications that are shared throughout the Bay Area and then are shared by other county systems. Um, we've engaged uh, with uh, community partners for, uh, for engagement. And so we've taken um, lessons from public health and have used, uh, have been in partnership with uh, promotoras and community health workers to go out into most vulnerable communities um, to share information about COVID-19, about testing, um, signing people up to get vaccinated. Um, our messaging has really looked at Latinx messaging in response to the high numbers of COVID cases, um, both in Spanish and in, in English um, and Spanglish. And so adding that cultural piece to a lot of the work. The other kind of this, this this kind of silent pandemic, right, that was existing before um, and now has been exacerbated and lack of in-person and all these other, um, and loss and grief, um, our mental health supports, you know, particularly uh, to our communities of color. And so that's kind of what my day um, or my, yeah, my work consists of over this last year. Um, most of my work, product, um, how about half of it, I would say, is in Spanish uh, over this last year. Um, and so again, a reminder of folks um, that all of the, all of your identities, all of your lived experience um, 
all of those things that perhaps at some point seemed like like barriers or had seemed um, you know at way challenges uh, I have found that through the work that I've been doing are actually amazing assets and bridges uh, and give an insight into systems that weren't necessarily centered on those experiences. And now um, I get to bring that viewpoint and get to expand the way that we look at things so that they are, are actually responsive to the needs of our community. So I'll stop sharing there. And I know we wanna leave some time for Q and A. So we have about 20 minutes to do that. Thank you so much. That was really wonderful. Um, I, I just wanna underscore this message that you ended with that, you know, things that might seem like barriers in our lives can actually be tremendous assets. And I really love that you are doing jobs that no one ever did before, you know, you're really trailblazing. And I think that that's really incredible and a, and a wonderful um, inspiration to so many students. It's like, maybe the job doesn't exist yet that you're perfect for, or that you're, you know, gonna be doing in the future. So thank you so much for your, your words and all the incredible work that you're doing. Um, wanna open it up for a Q and A. Um, if folks wanna, you can either write your question in the chat or write your name in the chat and I can um, call on you or just shout it out or um, whatever, whatever works best. And maybe I'll just, I'll just throw a question out there to get started while folks are thinking about what they might wanna ask. Um, what, kind of advice would you give, aside from the points that you've already kind of mentioned, but is there other advice that you would give to, um, you know, SJSU students who are on the verge of graduating and especially in this climate, um, who are thinking like, what am I gonna do next? Or how do I move forward? Um, anything that you might wanna share? Things that I could say, but I think what has been most impactful for me, and maybe it's my training looking at social networks, right, as an anthropologist, um, but that it's really important to reach out, to really important to um, talk to faculty members and to kind of just share what you are interested in, um, share what gives you energy, share what depletes your energy um, in terms of the work um, because there might be some interesting projects that faculty members are working on or that they know of or experiences that might be beneficial. Uh, you know, also, I think it's really hard right now to stay connected, but to the extent that you can, you know, um, try, to, try to know people in your classes um, or, you know, join different uh, groups or activities. It's those network, it's those connections, it's those relationships that really sustain us in the work, whether it's um, learning about job opportunities. Um, and I'll share that, you know, the job posting for the Office of LGBTQ Affairs, um, I saw it and I was like, oh, that's great. You know, they're looking for somebody with, you know, um, this wonderful skill set, you know, that's a great opportunity. And it wasn't until somebody else reflected back to me and said, you know, you have all those skills, you should apply, um, that, it, you know, it took me a moment of reflection um, to then actually see myself in that role. Um, and so I think, you know, having people around you that support you that could become those mirrors, those, um, those motivators, sometimes agitators in a really good way um, is super important. Um, and so I know right now it's hard because everything's virtual, but in some ways it might be easier if it's virtual, protect, um, especially folks, you know, are better, you know, on text or, you know, on chat and things like that. Um, but really to look at, at the wonderful resources that you have around you in terms of, of people. Thanks so much for that. There's um, two questions in the chat. The first one is, um, this line mm -hmm. of work can be extremely challenging. What are some forms of self-care that you do for, for yourself to restore your energy? 
And then the second one is, um, as a woman of color, also a part of the LGBT community, I really appreciate you and your work. You're very inspiring. Thank you for all that you do. So I'm gonna combine those two comments and say that self-care looks, it looks so many different ways and it's all helpful for me in that moment. So I was just starting off this role when, um, when the Orlando Pulse incident happened. And I felt like I could do something. I could gather resources. I could, you know, um, so we had, we, we, we had a rally, we had a video, we created a tribute. And it felt really empowering to acknowledge um, the community that we lost um, in Orlando um, and to say their names in Spanish the way they were, you know, meant to be, how they said it, how how family members said it, how their loved ones said it, and there's so much so, pow so much power. And even now in the pandemic, right, where where so much is up in the air, I get to say that I can that I am able to do something. I can contribute to the problem solving. So I think that's one aspect of the care. Um, I think it's really hard. I don't do self care well. Um, I don't know if anyone else does. Um, uh, and so we often, so I often need reminders. Um, again, that's those support networks um, are really awesome. Um, I had a really amazing friend um, that knew, sorry, um, uh, that knew that I was having a hard weekend and like dropped off these like Lady Gaga Oreos. Um, and so, <laughs> and so sometimes self-care looks like that. Um, Sometimes self-care, like if I'm really, if I'm really good and I'm really intentional, I might um, really be regrounded in ceremony or traditional healing methods. Um, but sometimes that's also, you know, you have to be, you have to have enough energy to acknowledge that that's where you are um, and that's what you need. And so, um, and so for those who maybe are struggling, um, with trying to find self-care, um, to be gentle with yourself in those moments. Um, it's right, I try to tell myself, even though I might not always do it, <laughs> um, or sometimes beat myself up about not doing better self-care, um, but it's hard, it's hard. And, you know, I think sometimes folks um, may see your position um, and may see your achievements and forget that you, in my case, forget that I am human that I experience grief, that I experience insecurities. Mind me, uh, make me invisible um, and, and, and make me less than, and that's a constant struggle too, like on a daily basis for my own spirit, but in the work that I do. And so, um, I think the other is to see, see ourselves and others with compassion and empathy. Thank you so much. Um, Maria, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Yes. Um, this has to do with your comment about outreach. And um, I attended a panel, our department co-sponsored a panel of uh, Chicana Latina school administrators in Santa Clara County on Friday afternoon. And the event was held all in Spanish. It was sponsored by the uh, Justicia Bilingue uh, program at the College of Ed. And it was such an inspiration to see that. You know, I started my career as a teacher counselor and was pretty much the only Chicana around in a hostile environment. And to see these women administrators, their energy, their passion. And my point is that now there are people in our schools who are fluently bilingual that can put this information out to the community, uh, can put the information out um, to administrators who can set policy. And I'm thinking it would be a, just so powerful to get the information that you shared with us to get that out to um, the schools. And I'm talking about you know K-8 um, mm -hmm. schools. Yep. 
Yep, and that's so important. And it's so important to have these conversations. Um, so one of the training pieces that we're getting ready to launch in, um, in April is actually an early childhood exploration of gender. And these are for um, early childhood educators. So uh, pre-K to first grade. Um, and, and it's so important to have those conversations early on. And again, these are you know in a partnership with First Five um, and our County Office of Education and, and, and other folks who are connected to early, child, uh, early childhood educators. Um, and we need it in all the languages um, because if we can have that affirming, accepting behavior as early as possible, right? Some of these um, crisis or intervention points could be completely prevented. Mm -hmm. And I, I really, um, I really work to amplify and of families and, and parenthood, particularly for communities of color. I think the media has, um, you know, portrayed communities of color as not accepting. Um, and what we know, right, um, it's, 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 a, it's a representation issue where we know that there are some white families that are not accepting. And we know that there are some white families that are accepting. Um, what we see over and over for communities of color is the non-accepting pieces, but we don't see the accepting families examples. Um, and we know that they exist and we Um, immigrant families that like families, everything, everything. And, you know, we work with the family acceptance project. There's a process for family too, for folks who are unfamiliar with LGBTQ concepts, definitions, um, supports. I think ways of protecting. Um. Maribel, your your video is frozen. Accepting, and, and I am fortunate to have a you know a very Maribel. I don't know if you can you can hear me, but your video is frozen, and I'm wondering if you could maybe turn your camera off. That might help with the. Um, there you go. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um. So you know, I you know, I I'm very fortunate to be. Um, in a family that my parents um, were super accepting, um, super supportive. Um, and, in, and we, in 2019, had a gathering of families across California, uh, Spanish speaking parents that gathered um, to support LGBTQ family members, kids, extended family. And it was such a great experience. Um, it's something that most folks don't see. Um, I think we need to do more to expand that narrative um, of acceptance, particularly in communities of color. Thank you so much. Is there anyone else who has maybe one last question or comment? Yeah, Shaheen, go ahead. You're muted. Shaheen, you're muted. Okay, a uh, quick comment that um, this is um, such a informative study and I kept thinking about the student, whether in upper division on the, you know, on uh, undergraduate or graduate that often are looking for a topic to do research or papers, 
And this is a good source of information to look into these topics, because as I was listening to you, I was thinking there are so many of these things that a student can address and it's good for them and they're also their community. Uh, a very quick question. I don't know if that can be done in quiz. Uh, I was really interested to see that these distinctions of gender identity for the young people who were incarcerated, was it uh, somehow at the beginning and it was part of the labeling or was it just later on in incarceration that these individuals were labeled? Um, it, it is just one of my interesting topics and I'm really interested. So if uh, you wanna address that quickly, I mean, yeah, about the labeling of these incarcerated youth. Yeah, so they weren't labeled going into the system. Uh, this was done as a point in time survey. So the methodology there used by Dr. Angela Irvine was to ask individuals how they identified. Um, and it wasn't, you know, do, I do, do you identify as LGBTQ? Uh, but in addition to that, you know, asking them about gender, asking them about attraction, asking them. And so it was a, um, a really a multiple question um, for a methodology of, of asserting, you know, the categories that were created by the researcher themselves. Um, and I think that that's, you know, also a, a, great, um, a great point to bring up is the way that language is used. Um, and, you know, we know that language is a symbol and it's dynamic. Um, and so there's words that, you know, previous generations maybe didn't use that now are reclaimed. Um, terms that we use now um, that, you know, are very generational. Um, uh, and our young people are so innovative that they find ways, you know, to express themselves. Um, and it's also a reminder that we've always existed. So looking at, you um, pre-colonial text and in, in, you know, in Mesoamerica and finding descriptions, finding, you know, uh, the Nahuatl term for queer um, or for gay. Um, my advice for folks um, out there is use all the language that feels good and makes sense. Um, and, um, and that it's totally okay if none of the language right now feels like it fits. Um, and again, maybe, maybe there's a term that, that's just waiting to be reclaimed or created. And for folks who are learning about this, um, don't spend so much time trying to memorize all the terms and definitions. Um, because they're going to change. And I'm sure if you ask 10 people, what is um, these terms have multiple meanings and they're personal and political in those meanings. Um, but what's really important is to just um, affirm what somebody's telling you about who they are and understand the importance of, of uh, what that self identification is. Thank you so much, um, everyone, for all your questions, for all your thoughts and comments. Um, Jenny, I don't know if it's possible, maybe you can put the link to the Women's History Month calendar in the chat in case um, folks want to check out what else is going on. And um, once again, Maribel, I just want to really thank you for your, for your time today. It was wonderful to see you and um, the work you're doing is really valuable and really incredible. And um, thank you so much. So uh, that concludes for today. I will um, pass this recording along to Jenny who will then post it to the Gender Equity YouTube um, channel. And yes, have a really great rest of the day and happy International Women's Day. One more thing, um, I'm adding in the chat, if you want some great Our graphic designer is amazing. Um, so you can add to that, to your background choices. Oh, great, thank you so much. Thank you.